Now that is a PC. It's pretty. It sports a liquid-cooled 8-core AMD Ryzen 3700X CPU. It games on an AMD 5700 XT GPU. And because we're snazzy labs, it now runs Mac OS. And it outperforms Mac Pro at, yes, you've guessed it, one-third of the cost. Thing is that this video, this time around, we're going to show you how to make your own. After a word from our sponsor, the, well, there, there isn't one today, but my Instagram account. Be sure to give at SnazzyQ a follow if you're not already, because I have some awesome and exclusive content planned uh, that we're going to begin posting there. So be sure to follow. This system is the all new, all AMD Corsair Vengeance 6182 PC, which may look to the naked eye to be a custom built gaming PC, but it's actually a pre-built. But unlike a lot of pre-builds from other major manufacturers that use proprietary motherboards and, and power supplies, every single part in this system is an off-the-shelf part that you can replace or upgrade by yourself later down the road. And at a retail price of $1,999, I'm actually pretty surprised by the specs. It comes with a Ryzen 3700X CPU, an AMD X570 Micro ATX motherboard, R shipped with the ASRock Pro 4, you're gonna get 16 gigs of 3200 megahertz RGB Pro memory from Corsair. You're also going to get Corsair's crazy fast new PCIe 4.0 uh, Corsair Force MP600 drive. That comes in a one terabyte capacity. You're also gonna get a two terabyte spinning hard drive for your games. And oh, there's an AMD 5700 XT GPU. Uh, all of that is powered by a respectable 650 watt 80 plus gold power supply from Corsair. And then the CPU is cooled by an AIO liquid cooler, all in this beautiful Corsair 280X RGB case. What's most surprising is that when I put all of these parts into a cart on PC Part Picker, my cost uh, before sales tax and shipping was nearly $1,800. I'm not usually a guy that endorses pre-builds, but really you're only paying $200 more for a professional to build your system for you, uh, to test it for reliability and quality control, to install your operating system and necessary software, and then to provide two-year warranty on everything with customer support. If you're lazy like me, or if you're a first time PC builder that's a little scared, this is not a bad deal at all. I build PCs a lot and it was really nice to just get one that was already made. Just be sure to buy directly from Corsair because they also sell this thing on Amazon, but the one sold on Amazon is the same price, but comes with a smaller SSD and lower end uh, B450 motherboard. So buy directly from Corsair. But I'm gonna use this as my office gaming rig at home. Uh, but look, I also want a desktop Mac, which I don't have at my house. So I figured, why not make a Hackintosh out of this thing too? So I've inserted a second NVMe SSD, exchanged the M.2 form factor network card for one that is Mac OS compatible so that I can use uh, handoff and airdrop and iMessage. And look, this thing is crazy stable and unlike any other Hackintosh that I've ever built before. Why? Well, there are a lot of content creators out there, and I absolutely accept part of the blame in this, that have, for the sake of flashy videos and views, implied that making a Hackintosh is a one-step, one-size-fits-all process, and it just, it isn't. While it is true that getting a PC to boot macOS is generally a piece of cake and takes just a couple minutes, building a good, stable, reliable Hackintosh can require specific hardware, a more involved install, and long-term maintenance. To help you in this endeavor, this will be a guide on how to install macOS on an AMD system that I created with the help of the AMD OS X community, and in particular, user Hackintosh Slav, who has, a Como? who has a fantastic and highly detailed guide that covers just about every scenario over dozens of pages, which I have linked below. Now, the goal of this video is not that. Rather, it's to help you understand how to make a Hackintosh and where to find the resources to assist you. A guide where you just copy my directions step by step would suck, as your hardware is probably different than mine and future updates to macOS and Hackintosh tools may change procedures slightly. Besides, learning and understanding what you're doing is better anyways, right? With that out of the way, let's talk hardware. This guide will cover AMD's 15H to 17H microarchitecture CPUs. Basically, if your AMD CPU is from 2011 or later, this guide will work. Most of us, however, myself included, will be focusing on AMD's latest Zen, Zen Plus, and Zen 2 processors. Next, motherboards. Unlike Intel land, essentially every motherboard will work well enough. However, certain features like proper sleep functionality and audio support may be limited from one board model to the next. If you already own your hardware, well, then send it, I guess. But if you're buying new, it would be wise to Google search how Hackintosh friendly your expected motherboard is before pulling the trigger. GPUs, 
Uh, you basically just need an AMD GPU that is GCN based, which most every medium to high end uh, AMD GPU since 2012 is. Now, there are a specific few number of NVIDIA cards that are officially supported in macOS, but they're old and slow. So just use AMD instead. And I have linked all of the compatible cards and hardware down below. Once your machine is built and you can boot into Windows, use it or another PC for the rest of this guide. You see, the Windows Hackintosh tools are honestly a little bit better than the Mac ones at time of this video, which is a little ironic. So I'll be showing you how to do all of this on a PC. If you're on a Mac and you refuse to use Windows, you can follow the written guide linked below, but you'd be better off just virtualizing Windows by downloading a free trial of Parallels or VMware or by booting into Windows via Boot Camp. Okay, with that out of the way, the first thing we need to do is prep our USB installer with macOS Catalina and modifying what's called the bootloader. When you power on a microcontroller, it fetches its first instruction from what's known as the reset location, 0x0000. Zero 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 zero. Near this location is the bootloader, the purpose of which is to initialize the system and load the kernel into memory, which allows the hardware inside your computer to talk to the operating system. In Hackintosh land, there are two popular bootloaders that allow you to boot into Mac OS, Clover and OpenCore. Now, they're not technically bootloaders, they're actually rootkits and chain loaders that then launch Apple's official boot EFI bootloader, but that's, that's unnecessarily complicated, and that's why Clover and OpenCore are both referred to as bootloaders. The latter is new and thus a little more complicated to set up, but it's far more optimized. It boots much faster. It supports FileVault better, supports the newest versions of macOS, and most importantly, is most likely to survive future macOS updates. If you're on an Intel Hack Mac, then you can still use Clover, but if you're on, on an AMD system, and if you're on an Intel machine willing to experiment a little, OpenCore is definitely the future and is the bootloader that you should go with. All right, you crazy coot. First, we need to download our software dependencies. Now, these are all listed down in the written tutorial as well as the video description. Make sure you get all of those downloaded. And once downloaded, we're gonna ignore them, set them aside momentarily and prep our USB installer. Gib macOS is a relatively new and super awesome tool that allows you to download macOS directly from Apple, but on a Windows PC. Right-click gibmacos.bat and then run the application as administrator. Then we can hit the R key and press enter, which will only show us the smaller recovery packages, which saves us time and bandwidth by not having to unnecessarily download the entire operating system. After that, find the most recent version of macOS marked full install. Otherwise, it'll just download a tiny supplemental update that we can't boot from. Once that's finished downloading, you can close that window, and then we need to open up the application makeinstall.bat, which will, as stated, make a bootable install. Your USB key should show up with a number next to the corresponding drive, which you'll then enter with the letter O appended to the end. That will install OpenCore as a bootloader when installing macOS onto the USB drive. Then press enter. We're then prompted after a couple of minutes after the drive is wiped to locate the update package. That's the version of macOS that we just downloaded, which is stored inside of the macOS downloads folder inside the gib macOS directory. So once you find that package file, hold shift down on your keyboard while right clicking and then select the option copy file path. Go back to the installer window and either right click or paste the path into the window and hit enter. The installer will prep the USB key, which may take a few minutes. So be patient until it says done. Once the installer is finished, you should see the drive. <laughs> Once the installer is finished, you'll see a drive mounted to your computer called boot. Open this up and click into the EFI folder. And inside this, you won't see anything other than a couple folders because Windows sucks and you can't see a tree view of the directories in File Explorer. So open up the OC folder, then drivers, and delete Apple USB, NVM Express, and HXCI DXE. These are really only relevant to legacy users, and so we won't need them since we're using newer hardware. We are, however, going to leave FW Runtime Services, which patches our bootloader with NVRAM fixes and improved memory management. Then go back to the previous folder, enter the Tools folder, and delete both clean NVRAM and verify MSR. Now we need to add our texts and our drivers. Files in the drivers folder are used by OpenCore, our bootloader, and we really need just three. FW Runtime Services, which we already have, APFS Driver Loader, which is needed for seeing APFS volumes, and HFS Plus. EFI, which, I mean, it's in the name. <laughs> it allows the bootloader to read HFS volumes. 
Now we need to head into the kexts folder. A kext is short for kernel extension. Think of it as a driver. In short, it allows our operating system to talk to the hardware in our computer via the macOS kernel. And this is where we go separate ways, kinda. You see, the drivers needed to talk to your hardware greatly depend on, surprise, surprise, your hardware, which varies from system to system. Now, everyone is going to need a couple of these. Virtual SMC, which emulates the system management chip found on real Macs, which controls fan speed, LED indicators, etc. Without this one, your Mac won't boot. And then you're also going to need Lilu and whatever green. The latter patches are graphics, which all GPUs benefit from, and the former is a dependency. You'll also want null CPU power management if you're building an AMD system, since CPUs can't use the Intel power management features built into macOS, so we're going to need to nullify that. I'm also going to recommend Apple ALC, which will give you onboard audio through your motherboard instead of having to use a USB DAC or sound interface. But this only works on Zen series processors, and your microphone port will not work, so keep that in mind. Now we get into the land of, well, it depends. See, your network card, for example, will require a different kext if you're using Intel Ethernet over Realtek Ethernet over Theros Ethernet, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I mean, you get the idea, right? The tutorial that I've linked below does a great job at highlighting additional kexts that you might need for your Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, USB, etc. Now, once you find all the kexts that you need, and really, there shouldn't be many, if any, most will be fine with the five that I've used, uh, the easy part's done, and it's time to move on to the harder stuff. Okay, it's not too hard. It's, it's medium hard. <laughs> Every computer needs DSDTs and SSDTs. What are those, you might ask? Well, they're essentially tables that outline to your firmware the hardware devices that are affiliated with your system and their processes, like the system clock, uh, hiding embedded system controllers that aren't macOS compatible, etc. Now, this used to be a huge pain because you had to manually compile all of them, but luckily, there's a new, cool, uh, new tool called SSDT Time. Now, this needs to be done, and this is very important, on the specific machine that you intend to install macOS on. So if you won't or can't do that, you're going to have to compile them all manually, which is a huge pain in the butt, although there are instructions down below. So on the Mac, well, on the PC that is going to be your Mac in Windows, run SSDT time, and uh, you're going to need to open the app, hit the number four, and then enter to dump our DSDT for this system. And then after that, we're going to need to run fake EC, which will patch it for macOS Catalina. Then we grab the finished AML file or files and place them into the ACPI folder on your USB drive. On to the hard part. We now need to create our config.plist file, which is basically just a huge system configurations file formatted in XML. Without this, our computer will not boot. Now pay attention here, okay? Because this is where a lot of Hackintosh builders get lazy. There are some nice people out there that in an attempt to be helpful, will post their config.plist on a forum somewhere that you can probably download. And as long as your motherboard's close enough, your system will probably boot. It will likely even seem stable, and everything might appear hunky-dory. That said, you're asking for trouble later down the road, and it's really worth whipping up your own specific config.plist for your system. When people say Hackintosh is unreliable, 99% of the time, it's because they took someone else's plist file. So in the open core package that you downloaded at the beginning of this video, inside of the docs folder, you'll find a file called sample.plist. Rename this file to config.plist, and then copy it to your boot EFI OC folder on your USB thumb drive. Then open Property, which you also downloaded at the beginning. Uh, this basically just makes it much easier for us mortals to interpret XMLs. And then hit File, Open, and select your config.plist that's on your USB. Then once that's opened, hit File again and select OC Snapshot. Then you need to navigate to the OC folder on your USB drive. Once at the root of the OC folder, hit enter, and PropperTree will auto-populate your firmware drivers and kecks to your config.plist automatically, so we don't have to do this manually at all. It's super awesome. If you're a desktop user, you're probably pretty much done, and that's likely all we need to do. However, if there are issues, check out the OpenCore troubleshooting page or the Discord server, which has answers to just about any problem you could possibly run into. Now, we need to find a file called patches.plist, which is found inside of the AMD vanilla folder that we downloaded at the beginning of the video. Open it up alongside our config.plist in proper tree, and then delete the patch section from our config.plist file, copy the patch section from the patches.plist, and then paste it into our config.plist file. Once that's done, hit save on config.plist, and you're probably done. 
once again, follow the rest of the written guide to make sure that any changes that are suggested can be done. But other than that, that's about it. Hard part's over. Now it's time to get to the fun part. All we have to do now is shut down our PC, boot the computer, select our USB key as the boot device on our motherboard's BIOS or boot selection screen, and then install away. Seriously, you just install it like a regular Mac and you're done. If anything doesn't work, like issue with booting or loading the installer, iMessage or Siri issues, faulty audio, etc., there is a laundry list of likely errors as well as solutions, things to try in the written guide. Seriously, it's, it's fantastic. Like, I just suckered you into watching this whole video, which is way worse than the written install guide. <laughs> and that's it. Mac OS is installed. It's running stably on our machine. And so I guess the question now is, how does a $1,999 Hack Mac Pro perform? Amazingly well, and a surprise to nobody. Look, the numbers speak for themselves. In Geekbench Single Core, our machine outperforms every Mac Pro model currently available for sale. And in multi-core benchmarks, well, we're just barely behind the base model Mac Pro. Not bad for literally one third of the cost. Uh, that's not true though in Cinebench, which is a very popular multi-core benchmark. We actually outperformed the base model Mac Pro by quite a fair margin. Is this machine the perfect computer? Probably not, but for $2,000, it is a really respectable Mac. And I'll tell you what, I used to always have these big asterisks, like you should never use a Mac Pro when you actually need to get work done, or they're just, they're just not reliable enough to use day to day. I think that this machine is. Now, does that mean that it's going to be perfect and you'll never have issues ever? Certainly not. And I think that that comes with just the territory of building a Hackintosh. OpenCore is certainly more finicky to get set up. And when you're setting it up the first time, you might get frustrated, but chill out, it's totally feasible. If you need any help, visit the AMD OS X Discord. They're super helpful and nice there and will help you get your machine booted. And once it's booted, well, you probably won't have to mess with it for a long time, updates and all. Well, folks, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, that other button seems to work okay too. Get subscribed for more awesome videos like this one, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.